wherever you are in the world uh, and uh, however you're consuming this, it's good to be connected with you. Uh, I'm a early stage product guy coming, coming to you through this camera uh, with the vision of what I want to see in a decentralized world and how you as product builders can contribute to it. Uh, so uh, I'll get started. Uh, this is essentially a, a talk about how you as engineers uh, should be looking at, uh, you know, maybe a perspective of how you as engineers should be looking at starting up in Web3. Uh, I personally think that uh, it is a very engineering led movement uh, and uh, crypto is, uh, uh, it, it is a very powerful technology when it comes to trying and creating an equitable world. So uh, before I get started, I'll, I'll just quite quickly go through a, a short introduction of, uh, of, of who I am, what I've done uh, so far. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a product guy uh, and uh, I've, I've had the fortune of working at very high growth startups at a very, very early stage. I started my career as a journalist at Your Story. Uh, I, I told the stories of entrepreneurs for a living and, uh, but you know, as a result, I ended up actually learning quite a bit uh, about starting up. Post that, I got some street cred uh, at Hackerath, where uh, I helped build a very large community of developers uh, who would meritocratically be able to find jobs as opposed to what their resume said. Uh, we did this for close to a million developers. And I'm very proud of the work that I did there. Post that, uh, I, had a, uh, I, had this, I had the chance to work uh, with one of my favorite entrepreneurs, uh, Sebastian Thran at uh, Udacity. Uh, as their first hire after the country manager in India. Uh, we set up the ground ops uh, for scaling uh, uh, the EdTech platform uh, in, uh, in India. So uh, post that, uh, I decided to do something of my own. And uh, basically, this was around the time when Web3 was blowing up. And uh, it gave us the opportunity to identify a really big problem in the space that there weren't enough of you in the space, which is there weren't enough developers and builders. Uh, there were a lot more people talking about the promise of Web3 as opposed to actually going on ground and building it. Uh, so Lumos, uh, an innovation management company, basically bought a lot of Web3 opportunities to India through accelerators and incubators. And um, what I'm very proud of is that through the work of Lumos so far, we've been able to uh, give out, uh, up, I think, close to about three and a half million dollars uh, in the hands of the Indian developer. Uh, that continues to be the mission. Uh, and post that, we spun off a company called Builders Tribe, uh, which uh, essentially is a Web3 incubator that works with engineering founders uh, to help go from zero to one uh, through a community of mentors uh, who have been incentivized to help us start up. So this is me in a nutshell. I've been, it's been a little over a decade that I've been doing this. It's been good fun. and. I don't see myself doing anything else uh, in the time to come. And uh, especially with the background of having worked with community-led companies, uh, Web3 feels like home. And uh, it's my honor to be talking to more builders like you. And I hope that some, some of you go on and start up uh, in the space. And I'd be, I'd be happy to help in any way possible. Uh, I want to put out a few disclaimers. Uh, as soon as you hear Web3, uh, there are some uh, you know, assumptions that can come in your mind. Uh, I think the first thing that I want to get out of the way is that I'm not a financial expert and no part of this workshop will advise you to buy tokens. Uh, I, I think it's important to say uh, in any conversation per se, pertaining to Web3. Uh, I'm also not a lawyer. I can only point you to the general state of affairs uh, in, uh, in Web3 and uh, uh, if you do want legal counsel, I'm happy to put you in touch with relevant people who can, uh, you know, who can help you out. Uh, and I'm not a practicing programmer, uh, but I have a general understanding of products are built. So I hope, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some, uh, some of what I say uh, makes sense from an overview level. A lot of this talk is going to be about mindsets and uh, I hope to, I hope to be able to share what I have seen work uh, in this place for any one of you who's thinking about starting up in Web3. Uh, I have OKRs for this workshop. Uh, you know, uh, I, I call it a workshop, but uh, essentially uh, the reason I do it is because the last part of this, uh, of this uh, talk essentially is, uh, is a task that you can do at your own time. Uh, and uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to hear 
uh, anything that you want uh, with regard to this particular task that uh, that comes up in the end, which is built on the first two sections of what I'm going to share. So uh, I, I hope to be able to encourage some of you uh, to explore a career in entrepreneurship or crypto products. Uh, I think it's a very good match of uh, uh, of of building community-owned uh, products which can achieve infinite scale uh, and truly be equitable at the same time. Uh, so the first key result is uh, I hope that you are able to understand the general landscape and the evolution of the crypto ecosystem, uh, understand what a crypto product is, uh, why should you build a crypto product and why you shouldn't, uh, its advantages and disadvantages. And then uh, hopefully, you know, be able to build a very rudimentary pitch idea uh, for, uh, for a crypto product. So with that, uh, I think we can start with uh, section one. Uh, how did we get here? Uh, essentially, uh, the, the the theme of this uh, of this section, uh, we can start with Bitcoin. Uh, everything starts with Bitcoin. You really can't invoke the word blockchain without uh, referring to uh, referring to Bitcoin. Uh, uh, current explorations of where we are at, what kind of products are being built, what have traction, uh, and uh, you know decentralized autonomous organization, which is essentially the philosophical end of where all of this uh, is heading towards. We're far away from it, but uh, a world where organizations uh, essentially, you know, the, the users of an organization partake in its upside and uh, its uh, governance is open, fair and automated uh, is what most of the people who are building uh, you know, crypto products are heading towards. Uh, and probably some growth areas that are worth looking at right now, if you're thinking about starting. So uh, the first blockchain, uh, ever an incentivized blockchain to be specific uh, uh, is Bitcoin. Uh, everybody thinks of Bitcoin as a token, uh, which uh, you know has some dollar value, and uh, for some reason people speculate all uh, all about it, and you know it, its price keeps changing every minute. Uh, but uh, what it really is is a is a network that uh, you know facilitates a transfer of value in a decentralized manner. Now, what does that mean? And, I'm sure a lot of you here uh, are working in fintech and uh, would understand how uh, how this works. Uh, just that the, the way in which we're able to transfer money or value from one place to another doesn't have to go between intermediaries. It's, it, uh, the network facilitates it in a uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, and the people who uphold the network essentially get rewarded for it uh, with uh, uh, with Bitcoin, a, a native token, an incentive token. Um, essentially, these people who uphold the network are solving complex cryptographic problems at all times. Uh, and uh, the reason they do that is to validate every transaction for it to be true. All of this transaction data are recorded in every new, every time a new transaction batch happens as a block. And all of these transactions are written on that block. And uh, the original Bitcoin white paper, which I strongly recommend everybody here to go and read, uh, you can find it on bitcoin.org. You will notice that they refer to a chain of blocks. And uh, some smart journalist was looking at that and said, hmm, blockchain seems like a nice way of putting that together. But nowhere in the reference of the original white paper, the word came in. It was actually from the fact that it was a, uh, you know, it was a, it was a chain of blocks. Um, and like I said, uh, the computers uh, that are essentially uh, providing compute to this network uh, and validating transactions get rewarded for it uh, through, uh, uh, you know, through Bitcoin. Uh, the, the cool thing about, uh, you know, and, and, and the token itself, because of how fundamental the work is, the, the proof of work is, uh, it, uh, it has certain features that are very inherent to it. One is that it is sovereign, which means that I own it and nobody else can affect and uh, uh, no, no one's thoughts and decisions can essentially have an implication on the Bitcoin that I own by myself. Um, it's fungible in the sense that uh, ever since somebody decided to buy pizza with it, uh, you could change it for other things. Uh, in, uh, in, you could change it for other things like other tokens, uh, you know, land, car, homes, or whatever have you. Uh, it's secure in the sense that the value of Bitcoin that is held in my wallet cannot be changed by changing one value in a centralized server. I've got to do this across every block on which this data has been recorded. And uh, in computing standards today, it is not possible to do it. Uh, and it's portable, uh, carrying a 
few million dollars in uh, uh, you know in cash or gold uh, between one place to another is going to be extremely hard but a basic computer or a smartphone or a hardware wallet can do 10 times that amount uh, and making it kind of really portable in that sense uh, not and it's good to not compare this to your credit card or your your debit card which essentially is just a means to be able to spend money that uh, a government has issued and a bank holds custody for this is actually that money that you're being able to take across from one, from one place to another. Um, so uh, those th these inherent values essentially uh, uh, gave it, uh, these features basically gave it some value. And uh, what happened after that was that, you know, markets started emerging uh, for crypto. And, and, and it happened uh, using a, a, a centralized, in two ways. One is through, uh, two people interacting with each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis that, hey, I'll give you Bitcoin at this value, you can give me this, these many dollars. The exchange basically aggregated this up, this peer-to-peer -peer supply demand on both sides and facilitated trade uh, for in return for cash and crypto or US dollar and crypto or crypto to crypto as has become uh, you know, more common these days. Um, essentially, every network is what actually, the purpose of the network uh, is what gives value to the network incentive token that comes out of it. Uh, and that has uh, inherent value. Uh, and uh, these markets became essentially really popular, I think starting 2013 uh, to now. Uh, and uh, you can see these uh, in, a, in a big way, you know, whether it's Coinbase that actually just went public uh, in the US. Uh, they are a publicly listed company that facilitates, you know, crypto trading, which it still boggles my mind. You have Binance, you know, Huobi, Gemini, Kraken, Zerex, Coinbase, you name it. Like uh, these guys essentially um, uh, have aggregated supply and demand for crypto tokens, not only Bitcoin, but whatever exists right now. And essentially, price discovery, appreciation, and depreciation of these cryptocurrencies essentially happen uh, based on these supply and demand dynamics uh, that are uh, recorded on these exchanges. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that actually gave it a dollar value. So, so far, you know how Bitcoin is created, what it's, what, who gets it in the beginning, uh, and then uh, what uh, are the features that give it value, and how this value realized at the US uh, a dollar rate was at these exchanges. Uh, so next time somebody, you know, kind of tells you how, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, the value of crypto in dollars, it's only because these exchanges ag exist and they have aggregated the value uh, the, the demand and supply dynamics in one place. Around 2014, uh, uh, an awkward introvert, 19-year-old, uh, uh, came came about and said, "Hey, I like the fact that you can do peer-to-peer, -peer, non-immutable, uh, immutable, uh, you know, unstoppable transactions. What if we could program this uh, to uh, to run decentralized applications?" Um, uh, but uh, uh, so think about it in this way. So Bitcoin basically allowed for uh, transfer of value. Uh, what Ethereum, uh, the chain that came around in 2014, uh, created was used those core tenants of being able to do immutable transactions, uh, but in the context of uh, transactions within applications. Uh, and this could be applications like uh, Uber, Airbnb, uh, Facebook, uh, and essentially create transactions that happen there between peers as opposed to going through a centralized server. Uh, now, the problem with this is, and, and this basically kind of talks about why you should, you know, we, we kind of will touch upon why you should think about decentralizing something uh, in, in the later slides. But uh, the reason you need to think that is that is because blockchains is, blockchains in general are very, very slow. Um, these networks write every transaction on every block that is ever created. So the thing that makes it extremely secure uh, also makes it really, really slow. This redundancy is required uh, to make uh, something, uh, to make uh, transactions on top of these chains completely trustless. And uh, uh, that's the whole reason why you really got to think about whether you are willing to put the process that you want to decentralize uh, on such a redundant process, uh, on such a uh, on such a redundant system, uh, and only if 
it still makes sense despite the shortcomings of the blockchain does it make sense to truly decentralize something and that's why i think we're very far away from seeing something like a decentralized uber decentralized um, you know to an extent instagram or facebook uh, there could be parts of it that are decentralized only the parts where questions of data privacy uh, become uh, you know more and more uh, pertinent uh, but overall uh, think very carefully about what you want to decentralize because um using a blockchain is an overhead and it's only at that point where it's the the problem you're trying to solve is large enough to compensate for the overhead that you should think about decentralizing uh, decentralizing something uh so i hope that uh, that gives you uh, that paints a picture so we invented transfer of value uh, we gave the uh, we invented peer to peer transfer of value uh, we rewarded the people facilitating this transfer value with the token there was demand for this token because of inherent value that the token had uh, and it was discovered on an exchange and post that uh, ethereum the next level to what bitcoin uh, uh, a more feature laden bitcoin was uh, created to be able to build uh, peer to peer transaction driven applications uh, that would uh, do away with centralized servers and uh, basically create the same benefits of sovereignty of uh, of uh, you know security of uh, fungibility within applications and not just with the transfer of money on top of ethereum uh, there's essentially a lot of uh, you know um, there, there's been a lot of products that have been built uh, and uh, a lot of them are useless uh, as as uh, as many of you may find out and thereby their tokens also you know you heard these horror stories of uh, oh tokens not trading or my value went to zero it's primarily because the network really didn't solve a problem or the network didn't actually be utilized for the problem that it was intended to solve but some things are hitting some layers some levels of product market fit i mean calling it complete product market fit would be a stretch but Uh, i think some things are showing that there is public interest that that is being generated and you know decentralized finance is one so essentially uh, anything in the uh, in the financial system can be made trustless whether that's uh, uh, custody payments exchanges derivatives you name it uh, these can be done in a trustless manner this is where also there's a mac where is a very large trust deficit and uh, as long as the solution that you're building solves for trust and efficiency uh, by by decentralizing it it's it's when uh, you should use a blockchain and uh, to an extent defi uh, actually suff- you know answers that uh, problem it still has its issues in the sense that uh, there are a lot of people drawing loans but mainly for speculative purposes and not for running a business or to may you know to to uh finance uh, uh you know an invoice that's going to come in later those real world use cases still haven't come up uh, but uh, but uh, at least the infrastructure exists to be able to uh, provide liquidity to a pool uh, which can be borrowed from uh, and uh, the agreement between the pool and the borrower can be settled in a autonomous and decentralized way so this exists there are a lot of interesting defi products and it's worth uh, checking out uh the other uh, thing that probably started this whole uh, wave of interest in crypto uh was N- uh, was nfts non fungible tokens essentially a, a hash on a blockchain is technically non fungible but uh, tokenizing it uh, and uh, being able to uh, showcase it uh, trade it between people has has been a very useful innovation uh the thing to keep in mind is that it's more important that uh, this token is non fungible than the fact that it's a token uh and things that require authenticity uh can really be um you know uh designated very well with a with an nft today you may see an odd monkey or uh, or a pixelated photo of somebody on uh, and and that being called an nft but Uh, what's important to think about when you're analyzing these projects or thinking of starting up in this space is how uh, what does that token signify uh, is it uh, uh, is it giving me access uh, to a to very niche community 
Uh, is it uh, proving authenticity of something that's extremely valuable? Uh, and uh, or is it uh, um, you know uh, creating uh, uh, authenticity of uh, of skill which is very mission critical in uh, in certain things? I think these are where uh, this is where NFTs will actually find uh, you know real product market fit. In the context of crypto, uh, there's a lot of interest around it. Uh, but make no mistake, this is this is very much a bubble right now. And I characterize a bubble by uh, how the supply of something can out, is far greater than the demand. Uh, and even though you hear stories of NFTs being bought for millions of dollars, uh, it's still a very small fraction of the number of people who are minting and issuing NFTs today. Um, but that's, the existence of a bubble doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Uh, it just means that you being, you're able to speculate on it. And this is true for the entire crypto market that uh, the speculation somehow precedes the use case. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the use case doesn't exist. It just means that it's early. Uh, and I think we are uh, not very far away from starting to see NFTs being used for very valuable things. It could be land records, your, uh, you know, your, your digital certificates, uh, uh, your proof of contribution to uh, causes, uh, it, the, the, it's kind of limited to your imagination at this point. And, uh, it's definitely something that's catching on uh, space. So finally, with the infrastructure layer, uh, what we're looking at is a host, whole host of projects uh, that are trying to solve for the shortcomings of Ethereum. Uh, can we uh, find a solution to the trilemma that exists between speed, uh, security, and decentralization? Uh, can we make it easier for people to build decentralized applications? Can we make non? Uh, can we provide decentralization options for non-on-chain data? Uh, and I think that we're still at the very early stages here. We still don't have many one million user plus decentralized applications. And up until it becomes easy to at least serve uh, that kind of demand, uh, innovations in the infrastructure here are worth pursuing in this space. Uh, so I hope that gives you an idea of what concepts today are uh, probably serving the here and now, but uh, in the context of crypto, you've got to keep product market fit. Um, you, you, kind of, you kind of have to lower the expectation of what product market fit is because there aren't those many crypto users and the transition between web two and web three, uh, there's still a giant chasm that uh, is shrinking every day, but uh, the, the gap is still pretty wide. So. Um, you know, it's it's restricted to what the crypto audience uses today, and hopefully over time there would be that migration that comes in and uh, starts to use these products en masse. Um, it, there's small examples of it that are already happening and still in pockets, but I think we're still a few years away before uh, Web2 product market fit can be comparable uh, to Web3 product market fit. All right, so that brings me to the end of section one. We've understood how Bitcoin came about. Uh, it, it was interesting to know that you know Bitcoin was essentially an inspiration uh, from the financial crisis of 2008, uh, and uh, we actually want they actually wanted to create a system that was fair, open, and decentralized, uh, so uh, the public knew exactly what was happening with their uh, money and were responsible for it. Um, starting there, I think it's kind of mushroomed into so many different things with the advent of Ethereum and then the advent of so many things that have been built on top of it, other Ethereum alternatives and their own ecosystems and interoperability layers between all of these things, whether it be bridges or cross chain, uh, you know, communications, that there's just so much that has kind of happened. Uh, and all of these, uh, the one thing to keep in mind is all of these are fascinating experience, uh, experiments that, uh, uh, in today's day. Um, it still doesn't compare to what uh, really scale looks like in, in, in the Web2 world, uh, but I don't think we're very far away from it because uh, inherently decentralizing systems that have trust and efficiency deficits uh, have proven to be useful uh, in the past. And today we have the technology to do that at scale. Uh, so um, I, whatever you build today may be ahead of the curve, uh, but I think that there is, uh, I think we're very close to starting to see a lot more usage uh, come into the products that uh, that, uh, that uh, you know that you would go on to. Pick. So, um, what is a crypto product? 
right? Uh, I think uh, I want to be able to define a crypto product and I've been, I think I've touched upon it in the last section a little bit. Uh, I can define its characteristics and working, the journey of how it gets built, how it eventually decentralizes. Uh, and I want to give you fair warning because uh, I think building crypto products is not for everything and everyone. So hopefully you are able to take out do's and don'ts uh, and see if that it matches with you and, and, and it is something that you'd want to dedicate a good time, good part of your life to. Um, this, this slide is super fascinating. Right. Um, I think uh, what you see with the two yellow lines, uh, I wish I had a little more recent data, but uh, this was enough to prove my point. Um, around about uh, early to 2000, uh, you know, $66 billion get invested in the US uh, just before the dot com bust. And that shrinks down to your early 30 billions, uh, almost half the market's gone. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's followed by many years of sub $20 billion investment uh, in, in early stage dot-com startups. Uh, but what's happening in the time period between 2003 and 2014 is that really useful products are being put together. And this is your Facebooks, Amazons, you know, Airbnbs, Instagrams, Ubers, Stripes, all of this is being built in this time. And, uh, it's now come to a place where we're reaching the same levels of, uh, uh, of investments. And I think far outstripping that, uh, especially if you take the last three years uh, into account and how the pandemic has basically accelerated a lot of investments into digital products. The point I'm trying to make here is that every disruptive technology that uh, we've had in the last 30 years or so, where speculating on it was allowed uh, or made easy almost always had a bubble. I mean, I have one or two examples to show that, but the crypto market doesn't look very different uh, at this point. Uh, it's just faster. It's just a lot faster. It's compressed a 30 year timeline into a, f you know, a few years uh, here. And uh, I feel like a lot of that initial bubble that happened, uh, it's uh, the largest one is behind us. And today, you know, we where we are at, um, you know, uh, we are at that place where all these useful products that then went on to be uh, extremely valuable companies that uh, benefited and impacted billions of lives all over the world, uh, you know, came to be. So I, I'm, I'm starting to think uh, that at least it feels a lot like uh, the time when uh, the real important products were being built down low uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we are at that, uh, we are at some kind of an ascendancy at least when it comes to startups. Uh, this is not indicative of the market uh, that, that you're seeing in terms of cryptocurrency markets that behaves entirely differently. And I honestly don't know how it works. And I'd love to meet people who do know how it works because I haven't met any till now. But in terms of startups, this, this, uh, these trends are already coming to be. Uh, products today are asked for uh, what they have built as opposed to what your idea is that we used to be a white paper. Uh, there are venture capital funds, serious venture capital funds that are coming in with the foresight of knowing that none of this is going to work out for the next five to seven years and some amount of mid to long term thinking has entered this space. And these funds are extremely well capitalized, uh, kind of giving a signal out to the market that hey, if you're building something useful in this space, there is going to be capital to help you fuel it. Uh, which is very indicative of the of the ecosystem because it it shows me that somebody uh, has been able to see inherent value in this space and is willing to bet on it, uh, and that puts anyone with entrepreneurial mindset uh, among this crowd uh, in a good place uh, to know that there is a support ecosystem, both financial and uh, you know non financial uh, available. To you. I'm sure everyone uh, who's worked as a web two developer kind of knows these stacks by heart. Uh, you know, uh, soft, software uh, is built on top of infrastructure, middleware protocols, uh, and uh, it, it kind of uses this uh, uses the it uses these pieces uh, to um, you know it uses these pieces to perform the function that it does. I'm I'm coming to you through this uh, application via Zoom call today which is built on top of, uh, you know, uh, uh, hardware layer that interfaces with 
some sort of network and transport layer and you are experiencing this through code that has been written on this ui ux layer uh, that basically allows me to teleport to where you are and share whatever i know uh, with you uh, this uh, stack is not very different uh, to what exists in the blockchain world uh, on the base layer you essentially have uh, consensus layer uh, blockchains that basically confirm or reject transactions that happen on top of it in a trustless decentralized manner on top of these you can build smart contracts you can build storage you can build application specific side chains uh, that that perform particular functions uh, and then on top of it uh, you know you can basically build protocols that perform very specific functions whether that is data that's social that's comms that's you know verification or however you want whatever function that you're building and then deliver these protocols via apis uh, on top of which uh, application layer things can be built today if you ask me uh, most amount of work needs to be done in the blockchain uh, in the, uh, in the network overlay network layer and the decentralized protocols these things need to be built so that useful applications can abstract all of this complication of sovereignty and be able to still be a decentral uh, get a benefit from the decentralization part of it while providing familiar user experiences that uh, we currently use right uh, that we are currently used to right now uh, so that's that's essentially uh, you know a, a good way of visualizing this as a stack uh, if you ask me this isn't entirely accurate but especially if you are coming from the web to world uh, i think this uh, at least allows you to have similar frameworks uh, as to what you've been used to uh, so far so coming to the quick question right like what is a crypto product and I've, i think i've i've said, said this in the past right? any product that uses a public blockchain and i want to be very very clear that i mean a public blockchain uh, a private blockchain is just a really slow database and uh, uh, you need the, the most important part of the blockchain is uh, by way of incentivizing people uh, uh, by by way of confirming transactions you got to incentivize the community to do it this is the only way in which you know you can build a decentralized you know product and it by definition means that i don't own all of it uh, so uh, uh, it it uses a public blockchain to perform uh, functions without intermediaries for efficiency and trust gains so every time i look at a project and I, you know i invest a little bit and uh, as my as my work in uh, in incubator uh, in in builder stripe uh, as a web3 incubator my first evaluation point is are you solving for trust or efficiency uh, and does that get solved by decentralizing it and and it all starts there uh, and then from there on uh, you know your product make starts to make sense or just falls apart uh so it performs functions without intermediaries for efficiency and trust gains and it head in it is headed towards being fully decentralized and uh you and what that means is that i am handing over ownership of this network that i've built to its users uh this token will have to have some function that is inherent to the running of that network Uh, and uh, these uh, cryptographic tokens that we talk about these crypto tokens are can be used to raise funds and incentivize network participation so i may have sounded like a lot of words i think a simple framework in mind is a regular product a web2 product as the founder comes identifies a problem uh, builds a product and that becomes a company and then those company the value of that company is denoted in shares in a crypto product uh the founder comes finds a problem uh builds a product uh, that product essentially becomes a network a decentralized network and the ownership of that network and its functioning is denoted by the tokens so just because i'm replacing shares and tokens doesn't mean that they are the same thing uh, a share has a sole value of being traded and we depict uh, depicting the unit value of a company the token does that uh from a network standpoint but also has functions within the network 
in the form of governance, in the form of uh, being able to validate transactions, in the form of providing uh, network security, in the form of being able to vote, um, the many use cases that you can find. And we'll kind of come to a slide which talks about the various kinds of tokens. Uh, but a good point to keep in mind, a share and a token are not the same thing. Uh, they may share characteristics, but that's not uh, that's not the only, that, their similarities perhaps end, end there. So I, I hope we understand uh, what a crypto product is. Uh, and, and I'm sure anyone who's wanted to start up has definitely seen this slide where uh, I come, I have an idea, I raise a friends and family round, uh, you know, I uh, raise some early stage money, I scale it, I raise some more uh, later stage money, and then I go public. Uh, and then, you know, the sec secondary offerings and so on. In a crypto product, this entire thing is shrunk. This, uh, <laughs> you're in the valley of debt right up to your late, late stage money that you've raised. And the reason you're raising this kind of money is to be able to progressively decentralize your product. Uh, and you go public on day one. Uh, you're not going, uh, or, or day three or day four. Uh, what this means is that, you know, the rigors of running a company uh, is not with most founders by the time they're answerable to much larger uh, much larger community. Uh, you can literally keep these first two phases pre-IPO uh, as the same in a crypto startup, but it's just a lot shorter. It happens a lot quicker. Uh, and uh, the public event in this is the issuance of your token for the community to participate in, uh, in the network. And then you can still do secondary offerings and uh, within the public markets and so on. Like for example, uh, you know, you, there are a lot of older networks that are raising money again right now uh, to further grow and decentralize their uh, product. Uh, and uh, that can still happen, but uh, just same startup financial, financing life cycle is shrink the timeline to a year as opposed to many years in this case, uh, and know that by the time your product is ready to use, you've got to be public and answerable to a large community. This in the beginning used to be done in a way called the initial coin offering, a kind of a tongue in cheek uh, way of looking at the initial public offering. Uh, I thought that it was a very brilliant idea that allowed for people to back early stage projects at a much, uh, at a really, really uh, uh, foundational, you know, base, uh, base level. And uh, somehow because of how easy it became to raise money like this, uh, it attracted a lot of bad actors, uh, not the names mentioned here. These are some of the most consequential companies in our space, like Gnosis or Qtum or Bank or, or Ethereum. These are products that are still being used, but for every example here, there are about 10 of those that were just ideas that raised a lot of money and then just kind of walked into the sunset with all that cash. And uh, even in today's space, uh, in, in, in today's more slightly more mature crypto space, being a 2017 ICO millionaire is not a is not considered a good thing because um, you know it 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 was a it was a really powerful way for communities to come and participate in a network upside, but uh, the founders still had all the power and broken promises ensured that this uh, would not be the way in which we continue. What we have come back to is this slide right now. It's, it, uh, financing a crypto product looks very similar to financing a, a, a Web2 product. It's just, as I said, that the timelines are a lot shorter and you go public a lot earlier. Today, what I'm very happy about, especially as somebody who saw the Indian startup ecosystem kind of blossom and evolve into what it is today, uh, I'm starting to see uh, a lot more uh, products that have that are starting to show that, that they built something that they have some users on it before they even go and launch their launch their token. Uh, you know, uh, you can't raise a few hundred million dollars on white papers anymore. You need to show a proper product, and there's some amount of investing rigor that has entered this space. Uh, and uh, there is some real world usage that has been showcased here, uh, and you know you can see that in data companies like covalent chain analysis which uh, are being used to, uh, you know, uh, kind of fight uh, 
illicit usage of uh, of tokens so much so that they are more trackable than the cash and the bank ecosystems that exist today because it's all on chain and uh, and transparent and these guys make it a lot easier to do that uh, so uh, and and you know the good thing is that uh, community backing is a lot more educated right now that uh, i feel like every wave brings in a few people who come for the money obviously and then get burned by the crash and leave but then a small cohort stays because they're like okay this seems interesting let me learn more and with every rise and fall every rise and fall that's happened that cohort of people that continue to stay and contribute to the space is becoming larger so you are this this almanac of sorts uh, is being for is being formed that makes at least retailers a lot more educated today than what they were back in 2014 to 17 uh, and that's good because you know even at the community level you will be answerable uh, and it makes for uh, better contributors to uh, to your network so uh, this is what you're up against today if you're if you're starting up uh, it's still early days but one amazing thing that's happened in the time that uh, we've been seeing crypto products is that back in 17 uh, if you were building something you were probably the first of a kind today if you're building something three or four other competitors solving for the same problem with traction with funding with users uh, already exist uh, and that's amazing for the market because now the battle is being fought on execution uh, which should always be the the, the case for startups and I'm starting to see that happen in crypto, and I couldn't be more uh, happy for it. Once you build a network, you can pre-mint and issue tokens. Uh, a lot of uh, old timers that were a part of the Bitcoin movement still frown upon this, but uh, it has been shown as a way in which you can progressively decentralize and pass ownership of your company back to the community. Some companies have been able to do it quite well, like. uh maker for example have done a very uh, ha- has done an exceptional job of it and we foresee uh, ethereum has done a, has done a very good job of it uh but uh, uh we we will start to see a lot more people uh, uh you know start to the, the the playbook for decentralizing properly is still not out there some companies have done it and you can do it by issuing tokens in the beginning and not mining them the way bitcoin did so uh the kind of token that you that that you uh, that you issue can be many it can be stable which basically means that you have one is to one parity of a token that basically mirrors a treasury um, there are other ways of doing stables as well and i'm happy to discuss this outside the confines of this but uh, you can essentially uh, you know build stables uh, you can build a token that just signifies a store of value you can have smart contract uh, gas tokens which essentially means that every time you process a transaction you've got to pay the network uh, and uh, basically every base chain uh, does that an exchange token um, uh, some centralized which generally are only able to sustain it because of scale but decentralized ones like uniswap or social swap uh, have been able to really showcase its value in a decentralized world uh, a utility token which means that i need to have the token to perform a particular function in the case of filecoin it's to be able to store uh, or query data or earn it by providing compute into a decentralized storage uh, 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 space or civic from a access management standpoint or link from a oracle confirmation standpoint it can be currency uh, and you know more more recently it can be nfts as well but uh you know think about what the utility of your network is and the kind of token that you issue will be generated from that so so far what we've learned is that it's a great time to be building a crypto product right now the market's kind of maturing uh we've defined a crypto product as something that uses a public chain to solve for efficiency and trust by decentralizing uh and uh, is progressively handing over ownership of the company or of the network uh, to its users by via token uh, and uh, we've seen how um, you know the idea of handing tokens over on day one it kind of failed with the ico side of things and it attracted a lot of bad players uh, and how today uh, for a large part you're still building a web2 product uh, 
up until you have traction and you've launched your token. Uh, and we've kind of covered little bits of what your token can look like. So with this in mind, uh, I think there are some advantages of doing uh, a crypto product, right? Uh, you're global from day one. Uh, people say, okay, what are these, what are the best Indian crypto projects that you're seeing? And by that, I, I, the, the person asking me these questions are, which products are serving India? And that's the problem. You're not serving one country. You're serving this homogeneous swarm of Web3 users that are the same whether they're in Brazil, India, or the United States, or, uh, or the United Kingdom. It's, it's global uh, from day one. Um, I think it's easier to raise capital in crypto than uh, to grow a uh, and also to grow to a large extent because the, the token has value, it attracts a lot of users, uh, and large part of it is speculators, but still a lot quicker than what happens in Web2. Um, I think at scale, if done right, uh, it has the potential to be more efficient than centralized products. Let's just take the example of someone transferring BTC from one place to another. $40 million, I've seen network fees of $4 uh, come into place. And I'd like to see a bank that does the same thing. It's just not possible. And at scale, decentralization is more efficient if the use case really meets, meets, meets those parameters that we spoke about. Um, incredible network effects of participants from day one. You literally have uh, stories of people who launched yesterday and then suddenly the, you know, a very large part of this community knows about it because the hunger for new products in this space and being a part of its upside through uh, uh, value upside through token is something that you know, people want to be a part of and that really makes for very good uh, you know, network effects. Uh, treasury growth potential in a sense, you are issuing the token, you're creating that market. You own a large part of it in the beginning and you can really create behemoths. And I know of very established companies that have many hundreds of million dollars in their treasury, which they can really use to, uh, and again, audited by the community, which they can use to uh, you know, grow this product ecosystems, get more people into it. Uh, you know, get more user adoption for it. So uh, the way you manage treasuries here is far more interesting and dynamic uh, than how it is uh, in Web2. Uh, and, you know, uh, and essentially by, by building in Web3, you have a way of being very ahead of the curve. And, and, and that's very exciting to me personally, because uh, you get to see the rudiments of what is going to define tomorrow. Uh, and if that's of interest to you, then you'll love this space. The flip side to it is that things change every day and uh, you know, that can get a little irritating at times, but uh, uh, this, this constant knowing that, hey, this feels like the future and you know, you're at the place that defines it. Um, and and, and, and you know, I, I keep comparing this to being uh, able to come up with Amazon or Google at the early 2000s or the late 90s. Um, and then, you know, to me, these are things that make crypto products very exciting. Um, disadvantages is that the talent pool in the tree is very hard uh, to come by. And you will face this as a problem. Most companies, uh, most countries don't know how to regulate this kind of product, uh, which essentially means that when you set up a regulatory structure for the time that you're a Web2 company uh, or you're progressively decentralizing, it's going to be expensive. Uh, it's very volatile. You, the markets really affect how your product goes to market. And uh, every crypto entrepreneur will tell you stories of how the volatility of crypto mirrored the volatility of their growth trajectory as well. The infrastructure is still not mature enough and has scal scalability issues. The space is wrought with things that people have built on top of other chains thinking, oh, it's going to scale. And as soon as they hit scale, they meet the problems of scale. And, and like, for example, there was a social networking app that was building on a base chain that I'm not going to name right now. But uh, essentially, when they started getting a few hundred, you know, few hundred thousand users, um, every transaction costed them $5 on the chain, which the user had to incur. And that basically killed that product end to end. And, uh, these are just one of many kind of stories that you will come across because of how nascent the infrastructure is. Um, the UX in crypto is terrible, and my heart goes out to uh, people who uh, you know let stop using decentralized projects because 
it's just not usable and and if you are in this space uh, it would be really awesome if you know you guys uh, are part of the generation that defines good user experience on decentralized project it's a wide open uh, problem statement for you guys to go and solve and and maybe too early for many products and and that i don't want you to take this lightly right like the number one cause of death in startups is timing it's not team it's not capital it's not none of these things it's actually time and um, whatever you're thinking of even though the use case may be great uh, the adoption is still going to be many years away and, uh, and and that could mean the end of uh, end of your product so uh, i hope that paints a good picture of where we are at and uh, what a crypto product is why you know you should what current state of crypto products look like where it came from uh, and why you should and shouldn't consider doing uh, a web3 crypto product so uh, it brings me to my last section, which is essentially uh, a, a general framework for coming up with an idea for a decentralized project. Uh, the purpose of this is to reinforce some of the ideas and concepts that we learned in the previous sessions. So um, stages of starting up a crypto product, like I said, it's not very different from a regular product, barring a few fundamental changes. Uh, you're building with the end goal of decentralizing your project, which means that what you're building today should be owned by the community. Um, letting go of ownership at this earlier stage is something that most founders uh, or people with the intention of founding find hard to uh, reconcile with. But this is the end goal of a network. If this isn't, then maybe this is not the best thing for you. Uh, you are going to be going public from day one, which means that you're going to be answerable to um, what, I mean, the things that you're going to be answerable to are very similar to what a public company is answerable to media scrutiny, community scrutiny, investor scrutiny, and, and whatnot. So, you know, that's something that you have to keep uh, in mind. Uh, your revenue generation and token usage must be tied together. And by what, by this, what I mean is that the decentralization and the network incentivization has to be core, has to be a very core function of how your, net, how your network runs. You can still issue a token and put it out there, but you will have a very tough time maintaining that market. And I hear this from crypto advisors all over the world. Right? Like they tell me that consider the token as its own project when you are running it. And the only reason that that happens is because the token is not necessary for that project. Uh, and so uh, remember that the, the token needs to be absolutely essential and it cannot be a good to have uh, when you're building a network, uh, when you're building a network. Uh, and once the once the token is live, uh, doing multiple rounds after that may, is a lot harder to do. This is changing, but you can also mitigate that by managing your treasury. Well, we won't get into this, but I'm happy to share my learnings from companies that I've worked with in the past. So stage one, obviously, ideate. Think of a problem that can benefit by being decentralized and digital. Uh, some examples are money is insolvent to a user, has great friction in a global context and suffers from inflation. Bitcoin is a good thing. Advertising revenue has privacy concerns. Users should have a choice uh, and incentivized for interacting with ads with privacy. Content creators should be paid fairly without too much platform cost. Brave, Steam, there's so many products that do this right now. Uh, centralized exchanges have huge barrier to entry for new projects to get listed even if they have strong community following and they, are, and they aren't inherently transparent. What's the answer for that? A decentralized exchange, or automated market maker like Uniswap. So think, be able to define the problem statement very, very well. Uh, and uh, ask, be very, very hard on yourself as to why this needs to be decentralized and digital. And does it really make the current state of things better? This again is coming from a very, uh, personal place, uh, find a co-founder. Uh, entrepreneurship is lonely, very tough. Finding partners uh, is uh, is very important if you want to go far. Uh, uh, some of the things, uh, you know, you may be uh, somebody who likes to work on their own and be able to do this, but see, taking a project public uh, is stressful and is very hard and it needs people that you can share within at the most important pick part is a co-founder who can complement you uh, really really well and as engineers i think having a business or a community co-founder is going to be exceptionally useful at this stage build a poc step three is build a poc and put it out in the open uh, you know uh, 
I, I notice this with uh, you know with engineers and perfectionists in general, right? Like um, uh, it, put it out there. If you have a working product, put it out there. And I love this quote. I, and I don't remember who said it. Is like if you're not ashamed of your first version, you're already late uh, to the market. And, and and this phase is not to launch. It's actually to collect feedback. It's it's a reason to believe that you can solve the problem that you're doing. It. This minimum viable product is extremely important to put out at the earliest. Ship it, build a POC and ship it, uh, and find early backers. Uh, you know, uh, this is. Um, uh, the, the the cool thing about crypto is that because of how fast the space has grown, uh, is that anyone who's been in the space for long enough has some money and can definitely add a lot of value because they've seen the way uh, the the space has grown. Um, pitch to pitch to them and see if uh, they resonate with your vision. And uh, you know, uh, I would be happy to listen to some of your products that come out of here. And, uh, it may not be a lot of money, but uh, it's definitely access to an ecosystem, and I'm happy to. Uh, support you in any way, and this is the same same logic that you're going to find with everyone else in the crypto angel ecosystem. And what you do here uh, is you part with some portion of your network supply uh, to people who buy into your vision, and most importantly, find those people at this stage who can add value to you. Can you help me hire my first five engineers? Can you uh, help me test my product really well? Can you give me product level feedback uh, on a regular basis? Can you help me connect with other funds to raise? To the next level. So always have your value adds in mind. And this stage of tokens that you're giving out or equity or shares that you're giving out has to be given to people who really move the needle to you, needle for you. So find early backers, which is step four. And then define a token model, right? Uh, this means token utility, economics, and release schedule. Uh, ideally, the way it's being done and you know the playbook for building token models and token economics is not there yet. Uh, if some of you are mechanism design experts or understand game theory, you will find it a lot easier to build robust token models. Uh, idea or others essentially hack it by looking at other projects that do the same thing or do similar things uh, and uh, are able to build uh, you know, token models uh, that are similar to it. Uh, if in your early stage, when you're raising money, finding a token engineering advisor is, it's, it's going to be invaluable. And, uh, these are people who've seen projects that have started with no token, built something or iterated it, and then see it sustain in, in the market. So it uh, would be good to get a uh, token engineering guy uh, you know, on board as an investor. If you get it in the, you get them in the team, then uh, you know, do tell me where you are also looking for people. <laughs> They're extremely hard to come by. Uh, set up your token issuance structure. This is usually a law firm that will come come and help you out with uh, how to set up the company to be as compliant as possible. Uh, this is usually pretty expensive. Uh, try to see if you can incentivize them with sweat tokens or, or equity. Uh, again, that first phase that of, of backers that you found, early advisors and early investors can also help you out with this. Uh, the use of proceeds, essentially the way you define how the what the tokens are going to be used for this is as fair as it gets. Most of your token supply needs to be given to the community. Uh, and then essentially the rest of it uh, is uh, for early equity holders, your seed round, your private rounds, uh, and your listing. And a part of it is for your team, uh, team and advisors. So this is a roughly a good model for companies that want to essentially give most of their ownership to the community. Once you have some products, some money in the bank, you have a token model ready, some traction, uh, you know, raise your next rounds. Uh, this will obviously be at a higher valuation from your seed rounds and institutions usually come in in this space. Uh, again, your advisors or the mentors and the early investors here will be uh, very invaluable here. If you're lucky, some of them are already LPs and advisors to other funds or partners at other funds that can then help you raise capital. Uh, a lot of the early stage crypto game is amassing enough capital to be able to go public. And uh, these are probably some rules that may help you out in, in, in doing that. Then you launch your token to the public. Uh, before your token, gen uh, you know, uh, your token generation event, you can essentially airdrop these tokens to members who use your product Retail public will, uh, you know, uh, see uh, will see in this current cycle what uh, they, they'll actually come together 
with what's known as an initial tax offering, where a small portion of your supply is given out to the community. Uh, and this should ideally be your last fundraise, usually between a very large three to $10 million round. And post this, you list on a decentralized exchange. And what this means is that the token is tradable against other assets in the space. So you've got all the financial things out, focus on your product from this point on, and, and you know, essentially hire, grow, but don't forget the core tenant. By this point, you're sitting on a large treasury, you've got some you know, great people backing you, you've got a lot of money. Uh, don't forget that the end game is decentralization. Don't forget the community, you've got to be answerable to, answerable to them from day one. Uh, and even if you are blessed with amazing you know, token liquidity and uh, token growth, uh, don't forget that you're doing all of this uh, for eventually building a network that is decentralized, that does the job better and shares the upside of its growth with its users. And that's it from my end. Uh, I hope this was useful. I hope this walked you through the journey in the current state of, of you know, crypto products and where they're at. And if you're willing to, if you're looking to start up in this space, I'd be happy to help. Uh, I've been Raghu and uh, it's, it was good connecting with you guys over this call. Thanks for having me. Thank <laughs> you.